Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth installment of SAG Indies Working Through panel series. My name is Michael Slotik. I'm an independent filmmaker and the New York consultant for SAG Indie. Uh, initiated during the height of the COVID pandemic uh, as a means of helping independent filmmakers weather the storm, this series continues as a means of providing filmmakers insights from experienced motion picture professionals on numerous subjects. Today's panelists include three auteur filmmakers who have created legendary works of groundbreaking cinema and socio-political art uh, that have been recognized by audiences and received numerous major international awards and honors over the years. Um, so I'm thrilled, truly thrilled to welcome filmmakers Charles Burnett, uh, Alex Cox, and Deborah Granick. Thank you all so much for being here and for participating and taking out some time. It's really uh, a treat to have you. Um, so we're going to cover a few different topics, uh, project development, uh, career trajectories, the industry itself, and, and touch a bit on uh, sociopolitics as well. Um, so uh, as mentioned, feel free, please, to, to jump in at any point uh, with answers um, or thoughts um, and questions, too. If you have questions for each other, that's perfectly fine. Um, so I, I'm curious to begin with, what, what drives each of you to pursue a new project? What, do, do you find that uh, ideas present themselves to you through a character or a story, or, or are you digging for fresh ideas based on themes? Uh, or, 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 or subjects, or, or you know, where, how do you come to a new project for the most part? Anyone? <laughs> I think you named all of them. <laughs> all of the above. Yeah. All of the above for each of you, Charles. You as well. Yeah, I think so. It 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 it, it varies. You know, it could be an image, um, a theme. And, so and it also depends on if I can do it or not. You know, if, I, if I can see a way of doing it, that also helps, you know. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just sits there. Yeah. I think that's right. It's what you're capable of, of doing and what you might be able to get off, you know, isn't it? Because otherwise, um, it's all hypothetical. We'd be developing projects. So it's, so it's, it's practical, too. It's what's practical and achievable. Because, you know, when vendors used to talk about um, seeing an equal, a larger collection of films that didn't get made from all of us, right? Like he, he always wondered about this project because every filmmaker has, I don't know what the mathematical, you know, exuberant, you know, number would be, but 10 times more films that have been made in their minds or hundreds more, right? And the, so we all keep these notebooks, you know, we have thousands of these notebooks everywhere, all over our offices, you know, all these notebooks, Lots of films are in them. And then as you, right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I don't even want to turn my camera towards my bulging collection of notebooks, you know. You know, um, filmmakers, especially indie filmmakers, right? One of our, our, one of our almost compulsions is that we're note takers, right? We're just constantly clocking and observing and trying to like make sense of anything that we can and take these notes, we're scribes. And so scribes c collect these notes and these notes. But I feel like what Charles was saying is like, then becomes very, very real about what could get made. What, what, would, what could I make without a crane, without a jib, without scissor lift, without a big lighting package, you know? I feel like when kinos became popular, like many indie filmmakers felt like they could make a couple more films out of that notebook, you know? Mm -hmm. like, I feel that the when you're not just doing like a very autonomous diaristic, you know, no crew project, then the next big component becomes feasibility. Like the creative is probably not a problem, like given that we've just all admitted that we keep these repositories of ideas. It's like which one would use the resources that wouldn't cost my entire lifetime to garner, you know, or where I wouldn't just be waiting for somebody else to green light it, so to speak, you know. So how many, you know, feasible, makeable projects might you uh, be spinning at one time? Do you, do you find it's best to, to really focus on, 
on the one that you want to do right now that can be done right now? Or do you find it's best to try and have advancing one or two or three or four at the same time? I, 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 I can't think to have a number of projects and get, get off the ground because if you spend your time on one, that could be a whole lifetime and nothing happens, you know? So you have to have a shotgun-like effect, you know? And, and also the fact that, you know, speaking of notes, I mean, I've taken notes over the years and I look back on them, I can't even read what I've said, you know? It's like scribbles, you know? And I say, oh God, what, what do I, what did I mean by this, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, uh, it, they have a sort of a short lifespan in that mode, you know? And, uh, you know, it, 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 I think things are very timely, so you have to hit it while, while, while the, you know, while the iron is hot, you know. Otherwise, it sort of like drifts off into space and you come back and you say, what was this all about, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have to find people who are really excited about your project as well. It's not just you being excited. You have to, you know, people who understand and otherwise you get people who are interested, but then they want to change it, you know? And, and just destroy it. And so that makes it very difficult as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, like, well, I think one at a time for me, I would like focus on one thing and follow it for a, for a while. But like you say, at a certain point, you just got to know it's either going to happen or it's not. And if it's not going to happen, then you give it up and pursue another one. Mm -hmm. But do you do you in in the process of considering feasibility? Is there? I mean, I'm sure you receive pushback, but is there a level where you consider the market, or is it you know? And there, have you gone back and made tweaks to help for the market, or do you just plow forward with the vision that you have? Oh, I think unless. I think consideration of the market is, you know, I, I, I always have a romanticized view of like Cassavetti's era, you know, uh, eras in which there was this uh, moment of introducing, you know, who was the, um, right, the, the documentary that just, that came out last year that Ira Deutschman did about the art house uh, programmer. Mr. Rogoff, is that, chasing yeah. Mr. Yeah. is that what it's called? Yeah. 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 Uh, that era of, uh, I mean, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, now I'm just speaking about the US right now because mm -hmm. I, I feel like other countries experimented at different times in much, much more profound ways. You know, I'm thinking of, um, you know, much more like the 60s for Britain and the Czech Republic and, you know, other places in Europe. And then I feel like there was this opening in the US where it was about introducing audiences to different kinds of films, films without traditional looking stars and, and films that were taking on um, scenarios and, and scenes and tensions from, from people's ordinary lives. Um, and then I feel like for me, there was this feeling that it was like a dark period where there needed to be these, even imposed on the indie community or, or commercial concerns, commercial concerns. I'll lose my shirt. I'll lose my shirt on this. There wasn't that adventure feeling that, um, that films, but then, but then I felt like the community took it back a little bit. There was the indigent movement, you know, and in, in out, of de out of the North, of Europe, the dogma movement, you know, different things in the 90s tried to reclaim this idea that there was space to always introduce audiences to different, less traditionally commercial looking and feeling and thinking films. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's this, 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 um, this to and fro, this to and fro never goes away. But Trojan horse will, will never be a bad strategy. You know, having some way for commercial, so to speak, commercial slant to not be alienated, but for you to be doing as much as you can that is actually your own style, your own thoughts, your own politics, but giving some aspect that feels like it's accessible to a, a more mainstream audience. I don't know if that's- well, Charles, you've, you've come, you've made films in a few different eras, obviously, and, and you know, starting off in that kind of uh, 
uh, Cassavetti's time. And, and I'm sure you've, I know you've dealt with different market changes and issues with, with financing. And, and do you, do you, have you found yourself in the past or even currently going back to your projects that you're having development and trying to make them more palatable or whatever it may be supposedly to, uh, to the, whatever the market supposedly demands? Well, it, it's interesting because uh, it seems to be, um, seems to me uh, that uh, there were people like, like, you know, like Ewan Gregor and, uh, 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 what's his name? Hill was in Channel Four. People like that. A older it was a, a more mature group of people who were looking for certain kinds of films. That they they had, you know, really helped to promote films. You know, so you can always look to them. Maybe start there to look for financing. But now it seems like there's a lot of people who just got out of film school, who are head of, head of film companies and things like that. You know, who are more commercially oriented. You know, I. I I, I I talked to people and they said, well, this isn't commercial enough, you know, it's it's too ethnic or something like that, you know, or or you know, uh, who's interested in this? It's like everyone is more interested in trying to make a you know hit a home run and make, make a lot of money. It's not it doesn't seem to be about the art anymore. You know, I have to tell people well, people there, there is an audience out here for this film, you know. And uh, and so it's those struggles at the at the starting gate that creates the problems, you know, and young people who have, um, you know, uh, these ideas. And, you know, I, I don't speak the same language, you know, I, I find myself, you know, if you're going for television, it's a whole different ball game, you know, one that uh, I'm, I'm so removed from, you know, you have to do like five years of storytelling and, you know, because you're looking for not like just one, one off, but like something that can last for five years on the screen. Mm -hmm. you know? And and the things that they're interested in, how to tell the story, I, I can't relate to, you know. So, I, I I feel like a dinosaur and moving away, you know, from, you know, a current situation. So, I, I just find it more difficult. The more, you know, the more mature the film is, in a sense, or an adult it is, and uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 a bit different. And I, I I must say one thing: I I can't use the word adult films anymore because I made a mistake. And I was looking for, I was trying to find, you know, these old classics, you know, and I put in the, and the, you know, and the Google uh, adult film on many classic films, you know, and I kept, all sorts of things came up that you can't even erase on your computer anymore, you know. So you have to be very careful how you use the words now and things like that. What kind yeah. of film you want to make? So, so you're not planning on making adult films anytime? <laughs> not anymore. I, I, I thought I was making adult films, you know, but I, I find out that it, I'm using the wrong terminology and things like that. I'm just trying to make a good film, you know, one that relates to people in a regular way. Yeah. yeah. Well, Alex, do you, do you find that, um, I mean, there, you know, how do you know when it's time to give up on a project that's in development? And, and not only that, but what's, what is the level of emotional attachment to projects that you, you bring to them? Or do you have to have a sense of, 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 of distance for that possibility that you may, that, that when things uh, may not get made? But I think you have to be very emotionally attached to the project or it won't be any good, you know, I mean, if you don't really care about it. Because um, it's like your children, isn't it, a film? I mean, you're your dog. I mean, you can't not care about it. You have to care about it very much, you know, and do your very best to try and get it on. You know? But if it's not possible, at some point that will become apparent. Um, in terms of the finance, really, it's just the financier is going to have certain requirements. If you're very fortunate, maybe they want to fund a work of art. Maybe they really like your, you know, what you've done in the past. But more likely, you're going to have to sell it to them on the basis of there's a guaranteed audience for this. Because it's a film about two cops on the streets of New York, blah, blah, blah. In, um, and that gives them comfort because they've seen films like that before. And, but it does, it does shift um, our capacity as filmmakers away from what Charles and I would have thought of as adult themed films mm -hmm. or interesting films.
But you know when it's time to give it up too. I mean, if it's not working, if in, if in, if after a couple of years have gone by and you've you've striven to raise the funds for it and they and you have not succeeded, then you'll know. Have have, have any of you ever uh, uh, walked away from a, a and said, "Okay, this is not getting made," and then realize a few years later that there is a place for this and re, kind of. You know, bring your Frankenstein back to life, or 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 is it once you walk away from a project, it's it's done for the most part? Well, it would be possible if the if the, somebody came along and said, "Hey, you know, remember that thing you were trying to get on?" Well, I guess it, we're very uh, flexible as filmmakers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But so, do you do all of you develop? Um, you're, I mean, obviously, you're, you're you're all. I think you're all making a combination of of narratives and docs. But with your narratives, do you write? Uh, do you develop projects with with talent in mind, with actors in mind, or do you kind of do that? Do your 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 creative first, and then start thinking about casting? Well, I would say. I am often getting involved with stories where the least the person is known and exposed, the better they'll be able to feather into the story. You know, the better I will be able to create the illusion that this fiction is in a world that's believable and that it's not IDing a person who's garnered a, a tremendous amount of exposure. Um, so incognito, and lived experience, like what I mean by incognito, not immediately recognizable folks, but also lived experience. So I'm always, the talent I have in mind is if I'm telling a story about veterans, like what veteran acting communities might I hear about? If I'm telling a story that involves um, a certain kind of trade where, you, where, you, where I, where I want to depict the trade on screen, who from that community could perform a role close to themselves um, using their real life experience? Um, so yes, the answer is yes, I do have people in mind. They're just not usually, they don't usually have name recognition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Which is a very different reality from, from chasing a, B list, whatever you may call them, actors. Um, and I mean, Charles, I know you've had experience working with some, some very big name actors in the past. Uh, or what was, what, was that a, a, a choice creatively? Or was it a financial choice? Was it something in the middle? Um, it was a financial choice a lot of times because those, those films I did lately was, you know, they, they were, you know, not independently funded, you know, things like that. So I had to go through this whole thing of going through a, a completion bond thing and all of that. And they needed to have some guarantee, not only the actor, but the crew members and things like that. So there was a lot of compromises I had to make because of that, you know, when it was outside of independent filmmaking that was very disturbing in a way. Because there, there are some people that, you know, uh, you know, looked the part and, and, you know, you have to work with them to get them to a, a, a certain, stage to you know and but they can contribute a great deal but actors can do wonderful things too you know when in the profession because i mean i had this notion this romantic view that well none actors are better and, and and so i mean i had this one particular scene where one of my this non-actor friend of mine i use a lot of friends who uh it was the first time he was in a film and so he got ill and so i was Telling him, well, he, he, well, can you make it, you know, on, on a certain day? And he said he couldn't make it, but could I get this other guy to replace him? And I already shot some film on him, you know? And, and so he didn't uh, understand it. It's not like a football game where you can change a quarterback in the middle of a, a game, you know, like that, and it'd be seamless. He said, well, can, can you get, get uh, you know, this other guy to come in and take his place? I said, well, I already shot some film on him. And so uh, he didn't quite understand it, but, you know, you, you, can tell, he, you know, he was an actor. He didn't. Um, study acting or anything and didn't further in fact he didn't finish school in any way so so it was a whole new experience for him and it was a new experience working for him but then I learned that you know when you're doing a film for someone else independent that you can 
they kind of need someone who understands the process, you know, because they can give you what you want like that, you know. These other guys, you have to sort of like spend some time working and, and massaging the whole character role and everything. And it's almost like typecasting, finding the person who is that person, you know. And so that helps out a great deal. But it was, um, it, it's, I mean, every part of it is, is, is a learning experience. You, you benefit from everything, you know. And, and, and so, wow. Yeah. Alex, have, have you, uh, I mean, you've worked with everyone from up and coming actors to uh, musicians, to your own film students uh, in your films. What, how, what's your favorite way to do things these days? I think whatever, whatever, you know, whatever turns out to be best, whoever the best actor is, is the person that you should, the director should hire um, mm-hmm. because ultimately the director is responsible and if an actor gets cast and then doesn't deliver a very good performance, well, that's the director's fault because the director cast the actor. Mm-hmm. You know? And if the director wasn't able to, to choose correctly or to get a performance out of, out of the actor for any reason, shh, director's fault, you know. So a lot is incumbent upon the director to cast the very best possible that they can and then our life is much easier as well you know it's like like Charles said if you don't have to um if you don't have to like spend a lot of time helping them and drawing a performance out of them if they can just bim you know do it and and and, and what we were talking about before we started the the the, the show that you're doing um with the prisoners or should we be talking about working with prisoners and and their potential for actors there's a film by the Taviani brothers called Caesar Must Die. Has anybody seen that? Mm. They, they do, they, these two brothers in Italy, they direct a version of Julius Caesar in a high security prison. And the actors are prisoners, you know, guys who've been mafiosi and, and assassins and robbers and stuff. They're all playing Julius Caesar and the other characters. And they start off, it's just like a play within a play or a play within a film, but then it takes over and you realize they've set up a lot of things and they're actually, they've involved the guards and they're shooting in a more complicated way. But it's a really interesting film. Mm-hmm. And it's done with, with presumably mostly non-actors. Mm-hmm. Or un- non-professional actors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and Charles's example of, you know, I, I always cautioned myself and I had to learn the really hard way. You know, I don't want to ever um, in any way romanticize the idea of just picking people who have life experience and expecting that to work out all the time. You know, it's a very, very delicate um, mixture of needing uh, trained actors to play against, to keep the scenes integral, to um, often be the people that anchor the scene because they can remember the lines and they'll have all these techniques for their professional um, participation in a film. So I really, really always, I, you know, I feel like um, Charles, you know, you, you finished my thought or not finished my thought, you, you added the very crucial counterbalance to what I was sort of putting out there, you know, which is, you know, the, the, training and the arduous uh, self-discipline that actors put into their, into honing their craft is very, very necessary for a film to get completed, for, for scenes to hang together. And then when lucky, when it's, when it works, of course, it's, can be very rich that a person with the lived experience that an actor might not have can also participate, you know, and maybe bring this, other this other layer of something in their face something you know um social realism which is the kind of filmmaking that i've gotten myself involved with does rely on real on on people having the marks of life on them it can't be just the beautiful and the special you know (laughs) because just it doesn't you know that those stories can only go they, 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 don't, they don't really fall into the social realist storytelling canon, you know? Mm-hmm. So when, when do you, um, generally speaking, when do, you, when do you involve a producing partner in your new projects? And, and, and how do you work with 
uh, a producers uh, with a sense of urgency, especially when when there may not be financing yet. How 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 is that partnership work for you? It's always uncertain because uh, unless there's money, you can't guarantee the participation of anybody. So you might be working with a producer on a project and that person will give you several weeks of their time for free, but then they get a job and they go off to the Dominican Republic um, to spend 30 weeks there doing a, a series for mm -hmm. Netflix. So you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, you can, you, you can get a lot of help from people uh, in terms of, you know, producers and writers and, and, you know, creative friends, but ultimately the, they, if they get a paying gig, um, they will go and do that. Mm -hmm. So do, do you find that you necessarily must be a hyphenate, right? You have, you have to be your own producer on your films, right? Yeah, I think we all do, don't we, to a certain extent, until, the, until it's ready to, until the money's there and ready to spend, and then you need a producer to to make sure it gets spent properly. Mm -hmm. And so are you all deeply involved with, with, with finding financiers and, and uh, uh, interacting with those kinds of folks? Or is that sort of something you hope or do hand off to someone else? I don't know that many well-to-do people. I don't even know our poor people in the same thing. We don't have any financing or whatever else. But I had a really great guy working with me, Paul Heller. You probably know about him. And he was such a, we spent, I don't know how many years, maybe 10 years or something like that, trying to get this film annihilation to fish off the ground. We kept getting promises and promises. We're going to give you the money. We had this actor who, whose agent claimed that read the script, who never did, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we were waiting for that guy to come. And we needed those combinations of things to happen before we can get the money. But, but Paul kept at it, you know, and he, was, he, he wasn't an egotistical person. He was always wanting you to get what you need and want, you know, and he tried to provide it for you. And that made the whole process uh, outside of independent film work, you know, well. And, and it was like uh, a, a good marriage, you might say. And, um, and he was one of the few, and, and, and I can't say enough about him, you know, and uh, he was always trying to, to make sure I was pleased with what, and, and, and tried to have a diverse group of people, actors and team people, you know, where I didn't have to argue about, well, we need more people of color. You know, he was right there in the beginning of suggesting that we need more women, we need people of color to, to you know, because it's a film, you know, and we wanted to reflect what life was like, you know, in the independent world. And, and so that was really one of the best experiences I've had, you know. And, and I, I had one with a, with a a well-established company. In fact, I did a film with Disney. I was quite surprised how, how they were trying to make it work, you know, and, and make it look the way I wanted it to look, you know. And I was always surprised at them, you know. Like, it wasn't about a Bambi kind of situation or make it look this way. No, they said, make it look like it's supposed to look, you know, and that sort of thing. And we're very instrumental in trying to get it uh, a, a, a good quality and, and, and one that represented um, um, a real life situation in a certain sense. I was quite surprised. I mean, it depends on the people. Sometimes you get one that are going to makes it very, very difficult, you know, and uh, those you want to stay away from. <laughs> I've, ha I've had great fortune having a producing partner for the last, for all, you know, all the films I've been working on and, um, you know, having her to discuss the projects at an early stage and, um, come up with some strategies about the first couple people we should be talking to, you know, making those early calls to Paul Schnee, you know, Paul Schnee being a casting director who is, his whole work life been super invested in seeing what creative combinations uh, of talent could get wrapped into a film, both emerging talent and established people. And so uh, my, my producing partner, Anne Rosalini, she, is definitely the first person who tries to come up with a strategy about where, who could we, who could we speak to? You know, I think the big difference is if a, if a novel or a script gets sent to, to us, you know, it's there's a much clearer path of who to speak to next. You know, the rights holder, the person who's invested in trying to launch it. You know, 
Um, but in terms of getting that first uh, conference, you know, I really think this is strong. Do you like it? You know, yes, I, I, I think we should, I think we should talk seriously about this. You know, I, I've been very lucky to have that kind of hyphen. You know, I do have a hyphen it. <laughs> She's right there, you know, to mm. sound out these things. Mm -hmm. Should we go forward? Should we, should we try to like get attached and take this long road? <laughs> What is, um, what's your least favorite part of the, the movie making process? Any of you? Trying to find money? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised that that's the answer? All right. Yeah. <laughs> that was a softball. <laughs> um, so what, uh, I once interviewed um, director Michelle Gondry a bunch of years ago, and he had this, this thought that, that, in order for a director to gain the freedom that they need to make the work that they want to make, that they have to kind of kind of uh, establish a, a style that is recognizable to uh, people outside of the director's world, obviously, the, the, the public, to financiers, et cetera. And he likened that style to, to drawing a circle around oneself so that people know who you are, but that it was important to, to as he put it, jump outside of the circle just before it closes so that you be, don't become a repetitive uh, 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 cliche of yourself. Um, is, that, is that something that you as an artist and as a filmmaker um, would agree with that it is important to kind of define what your style is and in and, and that way become sort of a commodity for your, for your own uh, work, that, you're, that you as an, as an artist are the commodity? I don't think I'm as self-conscious as the person that you were talking to, all that stuff about jumping in and out of circles and stuff. Mm. I, don't, I don't think about myself very much. I mean, I think, you know, what maybe immediately I kind of get, I get anxious or maybe a little bit, um, I want to offer pushback or something or is like, I feel very overwhelmed by branding in our culture as a whole, branding and um, the need for this differentiation in the marketplace and branding and branding. Like, I feel like it's part of the, you know, the ir irony is it's like, it's limited, you know, it's like, okay, so I'm known as a, as a, as a vegan filmmaker, but what if I want to make the next film with tons of dairy and meat in it, you know? Like, you know, I remember one time, um, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, what if, because of the financing that's been available to me, I always run and gun because I got 21 days, you know, I aspire to have 24 days to shoot a film, but in 21 days, the least lockdown, no gear, no dolly, no, no nothing is the way to go. But let's just say that I decide really uncharacteristically that I would like to do a period piece. And it requires maybe, maybe I feel like it would be best served by more of a lockdown camera. I, I definitely want to be able to like swing both ways and like go from like run and gun to a calmer, maybe more formal style of filmmaking. And, but I guess if I, if I was saying, if I was trying to like, stay true to who, the stories I'm attracted to, which may be my brand, you know, it is the social realism. So therefore, um, but gosh, you know, I feel that right now, just the way things went in our world with algorithms and boxes and two genres that are left. Um, and I feel like the least circles you can draw around yourself the more you feel free to be by everything mm -hmm. could, could, you know, I, I mean, I like, I veer towards that, but I'm, I, but I, I, I just, um, I know it's like, I don't want circles drawn around me. I want the films to be good. 
and to mm. tell an interesting story. Yeah. I don't want to be the brand. I don't want to, I mean, you've got to have some kind of ego for that. That is just really substantial to think that it's all about you and, you know, how you are seen as a style and a cool thing. I just want to use my first initial sometimes. <laughs> Go by a sit in it, you know, like a little, what's it called when you kind of think of it. I loved all those authors in history that picked a different name to go under. But I also want to bust down. I've always been interested in like a film by, I always, I, I love any filmmaker that writes a film by colon and then in alphabetical order, everyone that contributed to the film, everyone that, everyone that labored really hard to make the film get done. Well, does, I guess uh, that leads me kind of to my next question. Does, does your, how is your personal, how do you define success um, a, as a filmmaker? What has it, and, and not only now, but has it changed since you were younger until you are now? Well, I, I, I would define success as being able to have the ability to, to, to sort of feed your family, send them to school and things like that, you know, no matter, you know, at the end of the day, it does you have to make a million dollars or something like that. But if you can just do, take care of the basic things, you know, that that get you through life, you know, and send your kids to school without having to, to go bankruptcy for have student loans and things like that, you know, being able to pay that off and, and give them something to look forward to. I mean, my kids are, they're old now, older, I should say, and uh, they always sort of like very critical of the films I made because they said, oh, you don't make any money, but you know, why don't you, you know, do this and that and I can, can have this and that. And you know, it, it's something you want to do, but you, you, you can't, you know, you sort of shaped in a certain way. You know, like I came up doing the, doing the civil rights movement and things like that. So uh, I have this notion that, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, this is how I feel better doing these things I can contribute, and particularly period. I, I would love to do a lot of period pieces because there's a period, and it's not just for period pieces, but there's a lot of heroic people back there. I take my hat off to all the time because, you know, particularly in, 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 in during slavery time, without those guys making those sacrifices, I wouldn't be here today, you know. I remember reading and seeing these these people coming over in the middle of the passage and these boats packed like sardines, you know, and I keep thinking, I couldn't do that because I have claustrophobic, you know, and I can't, I'm claustrophobic. I couldn't be in, in tight quarters like that, you know, I just, but I give, I take my hat off to those people, you know, and, and, and all these other things that I read about slavery by another name, you know, and, and on and on and on, and the things she carried, and you read those things, and my God, you know, I, I couldn't have done that, you know, and so I feel obligated to tell their stories, you know, as much as I can, you know, as, as truthful as I can, but then you fight people who say, well, that's not interesting, you know, so forth and on, you know, and as far as Brandon's concerned, I, I uh, some friend of mine said they, they went to a party, they tried to recommend me for something, you know, and they d dismissed me saying that, oh, he's an artist, you know, like, that's a, a nasty word, you know, like, you, you, you don't make money, you know, things like that, you know, so I, I, I have this, this like a brand, whatever it is, and it, it's sort of like, it, it's, it's not, you know, it's like two different realities, two different worlds. One is a st you, 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 you're sort of happy and you're something that you're glad people look at you differently in a certain way um, and with a certain kind of respect, but then it doesn't get you anything. The thing that gets you something, if you, if you made a box office hit, a success, and you can make anything, you know, it, doesn't, it can be a, you know, some awful stuff, but it seems that that's the currency, you know, and but anything else, oh, he, he, he doesn't make any money. He doesn't do this. Even your, even your kids say that, you know, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's a, it's a struggle you have to live through it and hopefully that, but one of the things that, that really makes it worthwhile is this. Some people came up to me and says, your, your, your films changed change my life, you know, and that's worth it. Alex, any, any thoughts on, on, on not just how you feel about success now, but, but from when you were just starting out to now, do you think success, uh, your, your thoughts on success, if you looked at yourself as a younger well, man? Were when, I was, when I was beginning in, in, as a feature filmmaker, uh, the thing, the greatest prestige for an actor was to be in a feature film. 
Mm. Um, they didn't want to do, I mean, TV actors did to, to make a living, you know, but mm -hmm. feature films were considered to be, that was it, you know, that was what you would rise up to, you know? And now that seems, in terms of industry, that seems to have changed to a large extent because the better acting roles are not in Marvel Comics franchise movies, but in episodic um, stuff that's financed by the internet, you know? And so that has, in that sense, for an actor, the definition of, you know, professional success and prestige have changed. But I agree with Charles. I think that um, in the end, if you can bring home enough money to feed your family and pay for the house, um, then you've succeeded. You really have succeeded, you know? Um, I, I, beyond that, it doesn't matter. What if we had a load more money? What if we've made millions and millions of dollars? Then we'd be in a race with other directors who'd made millions and millions of dollars. You'd have to have a certain type of house in a certain part of Los Angeles. There'd have to be a swimming pool outside. We'd feel anxious when the Zoom meeting came. We'd do it indoors so you wouldn't see the pool and you wouldn't realize how we'd sold out, you know. So I think in a way um, it's better not to uh, buy into conventional definitions of success, but to keep it simple. I mean, my, my definition is, um, you know, just appreciating these two dudes right here, you know, like uh, breaking ground, um, being fiercely independent, um, and and then maybe throw in like Agnes Varda, just someone who like at 80, at 85 is still um, pulling out like this really loyal collaborator and trampsing around and shooting stuff, making things that delight herself, that, that, that make her feel active in her brain. Um, you know, all the cats down at Anthology Film Archive that, you know, made stuff deep into their ripe old age, you know, just Jonas, you know, people that just felt excited uh, about the ability to take some things out of their notebook and still feel excited about putting things together, that it didn't always have to be about the long haul collection, of, you know, trying to uh, pitch for capital and, you know, I'm not familiar with the project that you did with your class, but I, you know, it, the, the, the concept, just hearing that on the, on the surface excited me so much because it's like, this is, it sounded to me, or the, the, the image I made of it was that you had this certain bespoke period in which you applied some ideas that you had thought about, had active collaborators working with you to execute these ideas and it required growth. Whether, whether you liked the outcome or not, you found out why you didn't or you did, you know, but it, you, you, you were active brain, you were, you were engaged, you were doing what you like to do, which is to presumably record moving images that accrue to tell some kind of, some, you know, some kind of story or experiment. And, you know, so, um, and then, the, and then my two colleagues covered the bill part, you know, covering the bills and seeing if you can pull that part of that off, you know. Um, and who doesn't like, of course, of course, it's true. You know, if you get a story, if you, if you got involved with a story where people felt like there was something they could relate to or they felt that they got, they, it stayed with them for some reason, you know, yeah. that, that gives us a lot of validation and then that encourages us to, to try to keep doing the work. So encouragement is, is needed. I, for some, you know, I, you know, I'm not just a completely autonomous, you know, creator that doesn't need encouragement. I definitely also do need encouragement. And I also, I, but I'm very excited by people who kind of go but by any means necessary to keep making work. So each one of you had had um, films very early in your careers that really not just put you in the map, but that people still talk about today and still absolutely adore today. And I, I'm wondering, does early success, um, in, in retrospect, does early success create 
does it alleviate pressure? Does it does it create more pressure later on in your career or halfway through or where, whatever halfway through is, whatever that means? Um, does early success uh, affect an artist, a filmmaker uh, in a negative way, in a positive way? Any any thoughts on that? I, I it it certainly helps me out a lot in many ways. And it's I don't know if it's the word success, but it's the fact that I was able to screen my films at international film festivals, you know, and got the respect from that group of intellectuals. Where in the states I couldn't even, I couldn't even get a screening, you know, and like when I was in Germany, I, I, I and the young people's forum with, with Gregor and people like that, it played at the Berlin Film Festival, and, uh, it, and I, I was surprised that it won something, you know, and it was. And it was all this write up in the, in, the, in the local paper, German paper, and all the other uh, countries around there had the critics there. And it got all this publicity that I couldn't get in the States. And I remember talking to um, Bill Gunn, was talking about he had one, did Gunn Jen Hess. And, and people followed him to the uh, audiences, followed him to the airport. And at that time, you can, you can go up into the airplane. You know, it wasn't a security problem they had you. And so they followed him almost to his seat. And there was this crowd. And then, he, he came, uh, flew, flew into New York, and there was a soul at the airport to meet him, you know, and no one talked about his film then, but, but it gave him such, but that was it for him, you know. But I remember, uh, I mean, but the other thing about it is this, that when you've done well there, and I think for people of color, that was really important, and women as well, because they, they, it, it, it validated them in a certain sense. And then when you get on a set, you have all these people who think you can't make a film, and so you have to have that background to say, look, I made a film mm. and you can't tell me I can't make a film. So get out of my face with this. Not, you don't have that attitude, but you know, you, you, it comes that kind of a tension where they, they, they somehow think you can't make a film, you know? And, and so, you, but you have that confidence because you say, look, I made a film and some of the most respected people in Europe liked it, you know, and all over Africa, whatever, you know? So please, don't come with this attitude that I can't make a film. I've been tested. I did it, you know. And uh, so, get away, you know. And so that really helps you. And I try to tell, you know, young filmmakers, you know, I don't know if that thing if that still exists, you know. But now it's so difficult to get in festivals. Now you have to pay all this money now. But before yeah. it was, they, you know, encourage you to. And, and put your film in a festival and all stuff like that. And you know, it's inexpensive and so forth. And you get this great audience, you know. I, I don't know if that exists now, but I think for a young filmmaker, you need to make as many films as you can and get it to your friends and neighbors and stuff like that, the screen, and get that confidence that you can communicate a story and make a story. And, and so I, I, for that, yeah. I, I relate to what Charles just said very profoundly because the festival is a place frequently where people are primed to be open to different kinds of storytelling, a different subject matter. And then that encouragement does fuel you. It emboldens you to say, you know, uh, I, 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 I put forward some ideas and, and, a, and a story that I felt like you know, was true to sort of how I saw it. And lo and behold, it got some traction. There were people in this audience that responded to it. They, they wanted to have the dialogue with the film. They, they, they worked it. They, they... And so once you see that, um, it, it does really embolden you. And I, I have one tiny anecdote from a um, European festival where you know, I had never been, I, I just, I loved that people, um, someone raised their hand in the audience and said, you know, I, I don't see that many American films where every dot, you know, is, I, I, most American films I see, every dot is heavily connected. Like there's no room for me to interpret. Like everything is sutured really tightly so that there's no misunderstanding, no ambiguity. And I appreciated that there was like a little room for me to decipher things. And, and I was like, I took that home. Like that was, that, I, I, I mean, I literally, I took that comment, put it like, you know, inside me, you know, and it's, it was very helpful. It was very helpful because 
many years later when someone said like, oh, for about two seconds, someone might not understand. I'm like, they will find out four seconds from now. <laughs> it's okay for them not to know for two seconds. It's okay. People are thinking, people, people figure things out. People love to figure things out, you know? And so there it was back then, different kind of festival exposure, validating some things that I was trying to do. I kept the validation as a way to say, oh, you know what, actually, it's okay. People, people do. Well, I wonder, Alex, did, do you ever get tired of people asking you about Repo Man or, or, or you know, your earliest, or Sid and Nancy or like, or, or Charles, do you ever get tired of people talk, wanting to talk to you about Killer of Sheep or, or Deborah Winter's Bone? Like these are your, you know, not your first, necessarily all your first films, but your first, you know, early films that were really made a massive impact. I just imagine what it would have been like to be Orson Welles, <laughs> you know, because he made Citizen Kane at the age of 25. Right. And it was his best film, the best film ever. And so forever after, people are coming up to him and saying, hey, I love what you did when you were in your mid-20s. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I'm 65 years old. <laughs> just finished. You know, so. <laughs> good problem to have, though. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I, for me, the problem is, is that you know, people want you to keep making the same film over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you say, well, you know, I, you know, I get angry. Well, this isn't like your, uh, your film. I said, no, but I want to grow. You know, you're not allowing me to have this, uh, you know, adventure in terms of making different kind of films. That's the point of making film, you know. And and you know, like uh, these, you know, I don't try to put everything in the film, but you, uh, initially you do, you know, when the earlier films I did, I just say, well, this is maybe the last time I'm gonna make a film, so I put everything in there, you know, and and, and so it, it it cripples that. So I wanted to be free to sort of make different films that show different parts of the black experience. Like when I was in, in Hawaii, the Hawaiian Film Festival, believe it or not, when I showed Sleep with Anger, um, this lady raised her hand and says, you, you know, I didn't know black people had washing machines, you know, or this and that. The, the, it, the, the, the US is so segregated, you know, there's no interaction. And so, the, in, it's just, so that makes you realize that you need this diversity of culture. I remember when I saw a, a, a film outside of this propaganda film about the war, the, the Japanese war, and I saw, you know, all these films by these different groups and just opened my eyes, you know? And when I saw this film about, I was in the classroom with a Native American, an indigenous person, and we were, we were watching the searches, and I never realized the searches were so racist until I was sitting with this Native American, uh, and, and she jumped up and stormed out, and I followed her out, and she said, did you see that? I said, what are you talking about? Did you see what, did, what this guy did to this the woman? Kicked her down the hill. And, and I stayed outside with her, outside of the cinema. And we talked about it. But it took a, a, a person to have that conversation with to understand the, the, the problems with American cinema and, and this stereotyping of people and destroying their image. And so, and so you, you, you argue people need to have their own cinema, you know, at least part, be part of it. And, 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 and so, uh, no, I, I think you have to, you know, you made the film, that was it, you know, it did some good things, you know, like I said, it's, people came up and said, well, that ch film's ch changed my life and I really like that. But then you have to go on and make other changes in people's lives, you know, by making better and more diverse films. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, that's what it is about. That's great. So uh, in terms of the, the industry overall, do, what's your take on the current state of the independent world i mean it's it's is it do, do you really think that it's a case that things are much harder that you know cinema is on its deathbed or or is this you know another case of the more things change the more they stay the same like what, what's your sense of where things are at right now i think the covid protocols have made it very very hard for independent production um, it's easy for Amazon or Netflix or Universal to absorb the cost of the COVID protocols, but for a low budget shoot where you didn't have spare money um, to be able to afford all the requirements of the, um, of the protocols, uh, even though they're very sensible, is very difficult. And so I think that's hurt independent production a lot. And also thinking about what Charles just said, the fact that festivals are 
what independent filmmakers depend on um, in the absence of a conventional route distribution, uh, the fact that festivals charge filmmakers so much to submit their films, I think is a real problem. And, and I think that festivals may, might want to reconsider this kind of for-profit model, which they've all turned into over the years. Film festivals are big business now and they make a lot of money. And I don't think it's right that they should make it from filmmakers submitting their work. Hmm. Well, I, I think just as the economy of things also is prohibitive. Like when I did Kill a, a Sheep and these other films, uh, I got a lot of things for free. I mean, my neighbors helped in, they weren't expecting wads of money and things like that and, and fees, uh, licenses and things like that. Uh, I was helping some, some kids at Loyola doing some films and you know there was a scene that they needed to shoot a railroad track where and when I used to say, oh, you, just, you just did it, you know? And here they were like, oh, we had to do that. We had to get a permit. I said, just take the shot, you're right here. Now they, all right, well, the school requires them to have documents showing that they didn't, festivals require them to have documents and same thing. And so you, know, you end up having to have your hands tied because you can't get things because it, it costs you, everything costs money now. And, and so uh, a, a lot of people are doing it because, well, I, I, don't, I don't have the permit or whatever it is to do it. And so, um, I mean, everything has changed, you know. Uh, I still encourage them, I said, just take the shot, you know, you don't, you know, don't worry about it. But again, the, uh, this one guy took a shot of the railroad track and the school, and the school wanted to, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, suspend him. For, for having this, taking the shot of the railroad track without getting a, a permit. And he had to go through a whole lot of hassle and trying to get, uh, you know, for them to rescind this uh, suspension thing over, you know, him wanting to be creative and just do it, you know, on the way he can do it. And said, no, we can't, we'll get sued, you'll get sued, everyone gets sued. So there's all this, you know, legal things that you run into now that you didn't do before. And God forbid, don't do a documentary where you do some arch archival footage. I mean, people want to charge you hundred thousand dollars for some two uh, a second of, of, of a needle touching a record. It, it's just crazy. That's hurting. That's hurting a lot of things. I think. Yeah. No, I mean this this stuff. I mean, I don't even know. You know, I really appreciate everything. I mean, everything you just said about the permitting and needle drops and fees is just, it has truly uh, become, you know, super daunting. But honestly, I don't know any one of us that would wanna go further with this discussion. We have so much to say, but not on the record. You know, this is like, it's because I feel surveilled all the time, but I'm just meant everything, what you've just said about festivals and gatekeeping and um, what what this large red N might have to do with it that that I see, uh, you know, stamped on every single thing that gets made now. You know, I. I I wasn't sure what it actually stood for anymore, you know, <laughs> um, permitting and extortion for use of music and in a doc or narrative, mm -hmm. um, use of, you know, every film I make has hymns in it, not because I'm trying to, you know, but because there's some, I, I, I scour for public domain hymns. <laughs> you know, that's my soundtrack to everything I make now is hymns mm. because they're the only thing I can that are public domain that I can even you know go for. But yeah. but what I what I'm what I want to say is that everything you know if 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 your um, hardworking cultural colleagues that might see part of this conversation, mm. you know, we would have to move underground all of us to actually be fully honest. <laughs> I mean, we would actually probably feel like we're Bader Meinhof filmmakers or something, you know, because I do want to express those with colleagues. I want to be real about this. I wish we could do something about it. Talk. What about what about the level of contracts that we're facing now, where it says, uh, "I might, uh, we will finance this, but every single derivative concept that could ever be traced to this thing, we own." Mm -hmm. We own, we, we have a right to have your notebooks. We need to, I mean, a bunch of us need to get together actually and start to be able to push back. This has gotten so out of control. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I literally was, I didn't know if it, one of the lines was going to say, we also can have your kidneys <laughs> and yeah. other particular things, possibly household objects that we think we could also ask for, you know, in order to finance this. Um, you know, we could, we could uh, talk about the completion bond that Charles referenced and how it could possibly be so that a, uh, a certain kind of actor that you could get bonded for an actor that sometimes chooses to not show up when he desires to not show up. You know, when, I'm just saying there's complicated levels of what a completion bond really is doing, who's profiting, what it is all about. There needs to be huge accountability. We need to come through. We need to be able to finish our films and deliver them. All of this needs to be secured. I get that. My God, if you're borrowing money, you've got to be able to come, you know, make all that happen. But the ways in which it's done need to be discussed. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that you've raised some hot, important topics. I don't mean hot sensational. I mean hot, they affect indie filmmakers' lives very mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm but the ability to say some of this stuff in public is very, feels threatening to me. Mm. You know, I want to be honest with your, with your, with the people that might listen to this. Mm -hmm. And yet I feel that the three of us actually have to sort of be a little bit careful about what we say. That makes no sense. To be on the blacklist, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense. Just the notion that there is a, 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 uh, a the, just the notion that you can feel a bit muzzled is, is says, you know, a huge amount in and of itself um, about the kind of the corporate moment that we find ourselves in in many ways, that litigious moment we find ourselves litigious. in. Litigious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and to this, my, my last question, because we're going to wrap up pretty soon, um, actually it comes from a, a, a quote from Alex here from his book, X Films, um, where he said, quote, today an independent filmmaker is a revolutionary fighter in a prolonged popular war, unquote. Uh, I, I'm curious... Uh, assuming, I, I would assume that you would all agree with that, all three of you, uh, including Alex, unless his views have changed. Um, but what, do you have any advice for filmmakers, no matter what they are, we always say young filmmakers, but uh, there are all kinds of filmmakers of every age. Um, do you have any advice for, for filmmakers who wanna pursue that kind of filmmaking career, given the realities of our industry and, and the socio-political atmosphere? Any thoughts on, on that? Just go do it, go do it, but take care of each other. And especially if there's another pandemic raging and another surge of COVID, then pay attention to that and attempt as best you can to observe all the protocols, even if you have no money. And other than that, just go for it and do it, make your film and then try and get people to see it when you've done the best you can. Yeah, and I would say maybe um, take heart right now, like you could look to, um... Uh, upsurging places like new Romanian cinema, you know, other countries and regions where uh, they, where some filmmakers are, uh, for example, finding some, like, uh, a way maybe to film during the pandemic uh, without incurring this, like you say, this unabsorbable cost for, for COVID protocols, but maybe then the story is, is, the, you know, the masks are on and, and, and you know, that um, terms of licensing for billboards and, and product placement, like I think new, new Romanian cinema practitioners say like, you know, you put that billboard in, my, in the middle of my city, I can't walk by it without, you know, they're just, just looking at ways to not, not just buck the no, but to have this fighting spirit of this is this is what it means to uh, use the tools we have to tell stories we want to tell and we cannot wait our entire lives for someone else to red light us mm. i'm green light sorry it's green, <laughs> green light us. we can't wait at the red light forever you know mm -hmm. and uh and mm -hmm. so i think um yeah just even having like discussions like this today fortify us a little bit, you know, for an hour, I'm going to feel like very much like, you know, fighting spirit, you know, for the next hour after this, I'm going to be, it's going to, 
give me a little bit of that feistiness that I do need to have to do this work. Great. That's the intention. Charles, any, any other, any final mm -hmm. thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think I want to just sort of move away from cinema for a moment, because I think what's the problem is, is education in, in, in the school system. It's robbing kids of, 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 of the history of this country, conflict, you know, they don't want to teach slavery, they don't want to teach, you know, things that are crucial to make you think critically and have a goal of, of trying to correct things. Um, uh, you know, I, I was talking at different schools, you know, and, and I was quite surprised and disappointed that a lot of students don't want to hear about the problems. They just want to tell me how to get in Hollywood, how to, how to sell a script. And you say, I'm not interested in that. You can do that on your own. I, you know, I went through all this time in the civil rights movement and things like that, trying to, to do something that's going to change the world. You know, we were under the illusion that that's what film was about, a social change, and you can make a difference. I mean, you took all these kids. I mean, I must say this at UCLA when I was there, not the champion or anything like that. They had their problems too, but, but one of the things that students came wanting to make a film, they had two or three scripts, feature scripts, you know, and so it wasn't a question of say, hey man, you had to sit down and do this or lady, whatever it is. They were already at that stage, mentally wanting to make their film. Man, you go to schools now, you have to take a whip and, and, be, and, they, and, they, and, the, and, and the students grade you, if you make them mad or make, them, make it difficult for them, then you're out, you know, and because and they, they pay, in a sense, pay your salary or, or you know, but it's, it's like, we need to invest in, in, in education or somehow or another get these guys on the right foot because if you don't have that desire to do something, make a change, you're not gonna do it, you know? And when I went to these schools, I was so disappointed. And that's why I don't wanna go near a school talking about teaching because, you know, it's like a waste, not, I wouldn't say a waste of time, but until they change the, the attitude and the students and things like that, it's gonna be a downhill slope where people make it, you know, like you'd say, the Marvel films, whatever it is, and, and things that are, you know, bang, bang, whatever it is, freedom of dope and stuff. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a really a difficult thing to even attack, but it's education and getting students at a very early age to, to want to, you know, talk about with, with the, the democracy, if we have it tomorrow or not, you know, and make films about those things, well, I, you know, whatever, but, but in a way where, you know, it's, it's meaningful. I, I don't know. That's my wow. axe to grind. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's, it, um, it's super pertinent to filmmaking because you use the word critical thinking and there's so much room for entertainment, of course, and no one, none of us are anti-entertainment. None of us are anti-abandonment, uh, anti-escapism. No, no, none of us are trying to crush things or, but, uh, you still gotta, you still have to make sure there's content out there that has critical thinking as well. It doesn't have to be either or, but if we lose that, then really it doesn't matter if the algorithm then selects the films for the festival and for financing and for everything, you know, let it be that we've got nothing left, you know, so um, call us Luddites, you know, maybe we're all, you know, we could be called Luddites, but the fact is there's always got to be Luddites or, or everything's gone, you know, everything just evaporates. So it's our job, right? As a seasoned filmmakers to call attention to those things. <laughs> well, well seasoned, well seasoned. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Thank you all so much for this chat. I really uh, personally, on a personal level, I'm, I'm so honored to have this time with you guys. Um, and I'm so happy you said yes. Um, so, uh, and uh, for those of you who are watching, please be sure to share this video uh, and with your friends and colleagues and certainly check out sagindy.org for any resources that you may need for independent filmmaking. Uh, please take care everyone, stay healthy, uh, keep up the good fight and keep making those films, please. We're waiting for more. Thank you, you <laughs> too. And you guys again. Uh, okay. All right, we'll take care, everyone. Okay.